Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Developing a Proper Worldview. Uh, this will be episode number 49, and we're currently um, in a parentheses of sorts uh, between section 2 and section 3, or uh, part 2 and part 3 as I'm calling it, or step, I forget how I labeled them <clears throat> originally, but step 1 was uh, the gospel, uh, step 2 was uh, the creation evolution debate, uh, or debunking evolution. Step three will be a look at uh, American politics, the foundation of America, uh, the occult system uh, that underlies and kind of hides behind the curtain uh, of America. <clears throat> Step four will be, um, I forget uh, if we're looking at like martial law and the, the authoritarian system uh, that's being set up, especially in America. Um, I think that's part four and then part f five uh, would be uh, the New World Order, um, this global scheme, how it's not just America, although America probably is the driving force behind it, as, as at least the, the muscle behind it, um, but this is a worldwide system. And then I believe part six, uh, we'll look at the, the occult nature of the system and um, a lot of the false religions behind it and, and how they're all Luciferian behind the scenes. Um, Part seven, we'll get into the Bible version issue and, and show how that ties in, um, how Christians need to be aware of that. Um, and, and I think that's it. Um, so we've got quite a long ways to go, quite a few. Uh, if I had to guess, probably a, a hundred additional uh, documentaries that we're going to look at. So, uh, But right now we're at a parenthesis in between parts two and three, in between um, the creation evolution debate and the, the American foundation um, system uh, part. And we're looking at a biblical overview of the New World Order system um, as defined in a documentary series called Megiddo. Uh, we just finished part one and uh, part one showed um, how biblical prophecy is extremely detailed and 100% accurate, how, how God is the author of scriptures, and that uh, the entire plan that's playing out in history um, is the counsel of God, it's his plan. Um, although um, for a time he, he gives the devil reign in a sort, the devil is the God of this world, the lowercase g. He's the prince of the power of the air. He's the master behind the scenes. He's the puppet master. Uh, he's the, the tip of the pyramid, the all seeing eye of Horus. And so he, the devil, is setting up his antichrist system, his beast system worldwide. Uh, but God is the overarching um, sovereign hand behind all things. God allows and purposes and plans things um, for his holy and wise and good purposes. And that everything that's occurring, uh, while the evil people inspired by Satan think that they're going to throw off the rule and reign of God, that they're going to get rid of uh, Christ and, and his people, Christianity, and they'll be able to do whatever they want in this world, and, and that, that they're deceived and they think somehow that they're actually going to win this battle, that they're going to accomplish their purposes and um, that they'll rule and reign with Satan and they'll be given um, eternal life and, and, and so on and so forth. Um, <clears throat> really, it's, it's, it's God behind the scenes um, using their own schemes against them, using their schemes uh, to bring about the return of Jesus Christ and, and the kingdom of Christ um, and victory for, for Christians, victory for his people and the destruction of the world system, the destruction of evil. So all these things are playing out. And in that first Megiddo series, we saw how, how accurate biblical prophecy is, um, especially uh, it, it focused in on the prophecies of Daniel and, and how that showed clearly uh, four world powers to come into being um, during and after the time of Daniel and, and world history played out exactly like that. Um, in places, the Lord even uh, prophesied exact names of people. Um, and he did that too with the first coming of Christ. The Lord prophesied his birthplace. Uh, the Lord prophesied uh, his name, Emmanuel, which means God with us. Jesus was God with us. Um, <clears throat> it, it detailed how he would die for his people, the exact method of his death. Um, it, it detailed his burial. It detailed um, his, um, 
the, the means of his execution. It detailed uh, his friend betraying him for 30 pieces. So prophecy is very specific in the Bible, um, detailed and, and perfect. And because it's written by God and because this is God's plan, it plays out exactly as God um, said it would. It's 100% it's accurate, um, as opposed to other so-called fortune tellers and prophets who just say nonsense. And then, you know, it's poetic gibberish that, that somebody then says, oh, this is what it meant, and, and blah, blah, blah. And, and so we see the Bible is, is, is perfect in its predictions. And that being the case, um, if for our future, the Bible predicts a worldwide empire, a beast system, a worldwide antichrist system, um, which will require everybody free and bond, big and small, um, to pledge allegiance to it, to worship it. Um, you'll have to take a mark in order to participate in it. Um, you'll be cut off from the financial sector without this mark. And, and so that's the Bible prophesies that's coming. And then we look at the world around us and we see things actually heading in that direction. We see these things coming uh, to be uh, in front of our very eyes in, in, in our time, in our lifetime. It's, it's happening. We hear our politicians calling for a new world order. We see our dollar bill stamped with the all-seeing eye of Horus and the words new world order underneath it. Um, we see moves towards world government uh, from all major nations. Um, we see just a, a continual antichrist philosophy uh, from kings and rulers and presidents and senators, um, an immoral agenda. Um, we see this Luciferian system being set up. We see uh, that rich, elite Luciferian um, satanic worshipers um, control the entire world. They own the banking system. They own all the major industries and, and all the major financial branches. Uh, they, they, and, and through that, they, they master and manipulate and control our political systems. And so we saw the beginnings of that all outlined in Megiddo Part 1. And in Megiddo Part 2, if my memory serves me correctly, um, it's going to get more into the occult uh, foundation of this, this system. Um, in, in Part 1, it showed that this is a biblical prophecy and it showed this system coming into being. In Part 2, it's going to show the occult foundation of it and, and how it's a Luciferian agenda behind the scenes. Um, and that those in power are aware of this. That's how they achieved their power. That's how they got to be in positions of power and influence is by uh, working their way up through the different occult systems and, and in a sense selling out to the devil, selling their soul to the devil um, in the same way that the devil came to Jesus and, and said, I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world because they're mine and I can give them to whomever I want if you'll worship me. And Jesus rejected that, but in that same fashion, uh, the devil approaches people in high-level occultism and offers that same thing. I will give you a piece of the kingdoms. I'll give you a, a position of headship, a position of rulership, a position of authority and influence um, if you'll worship me. And because they've been conditioned and brainwashed uh, through the different occult systems, uh, they don't see a problem with that. Again, they think they're going to win. They think they're on the winning team because um, they're deceived. They're blinded by this occultism. So I believe in Megiddo Part 2 here, we're, we're going to look into that. Um, again, this is about a three-hour DVD, I think. So it's probably going to take us about three different sections to get or three different videos to get through it. Um, we're just starting it right now, uh, so without further ado, let's jump into it. All right, here we go, Megiddo Part 2. Was wir uns unter der deutschen Jugend dazu wünschen, ist etwas anderes, als was die Vergangenheit sich gewünscht hat. Wir müssen einen neuen Menschen nennen, auf das unser Volk nicht an den typischen Degenerationserscheinungen dieser neuen Zeit runde geht. of their own selves, 2 Timothy 3. It's a good chapter to study if you're interested in that times. Those first few verses of 2 Timothy 3.
all those names are, are good resources, although I don't agree with all of them in their theology. Um, Dave Hunt has a lot of good information on Roman Catholicism. Um, we'll probably talk about him quite a bit in the future. I know with Joe Schimmel, uh, we're going to watch a couple of his documentaries. He's got a lot of good stuff on the media and uh, Hollywood and music and stuff like that. Um, but again, I, I, Dr. Stan Monteith, if you're researching, that's a name that's going to come up a lot. A lot of good information, I think, on New World Order, Illuminati type stuff. Uh, Dr. Kent Hoven, of course, we watched his stuff with creation. Uh, my only my only caution would be um, don't necessarily go to these folks for your theology or for your biblical doctrine. Um, they might have some things right, some things wrong. Um, but in that sense, you shouldn't really go to anybody for your theology, theology or doctrine. You need to study the scriptures. You need to know what the scriptures say for yourself. Try to avoid um, as much outside influence, outside voices, uh, because the moment you hear a theory or an idea, it, it taints you know, you're going to read and your subconscious or whatever is going to remember that. So you try to avoid that stuff. Study the scriptures on your own. Study to make your, to show yourself approved, the scriptures say. Uh, the scriptures, let them define themselves. Study line upon line where you come across an idea or a thought. Study it out everywhere in scripture where that same idea and thought is mentioned. Uh, get yourself a strong concordance and you can look up, you know, where, where words are mentioned elsewhere in the scriptures. And, and let the scriptures themselves define your theology and your doctrine don't get it from other people that's such a key vital important thing many people um, instead of taking the time to wrestle things out for themselves to just study the word and to prayerfully meditate and, and and communicate with the Lord and ask him to reveal and guide and give you wisdom and understanding rather than taking the time to do that a lot of people just run to teachers and say you know what does this person say about it and they just get their mind filled and and so then when you hear them to talk about stuff they're just regurgitating the ideas of others there's no real uh, wisdom that's been implanted in their heart where, where truth has been revealed to them by the spirit they're just repeating ideas and 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 theories that they've heard from others and that's so dangerous because even the best of men make mistakes and errors and you don't want that you have to give an account to God for yourself you're responsible for knowing truth so you got to study it out for yourself uh, but when it comes to certain issues uh, there are men um, who, who are very well researched so when it comes to like New World Order or geopolitics, uh, you can certainly um, study these things out. But again, you want to make sure you have that foundation of the Bible so that you can test everything you're hearing by the light of the word. If something doesn't line up with the scriptures, you can reject it. Uh, but if something um, clarifies and, and, and gives added um, uh, context to what you're reading, uh, then it, then it's good and beneficial. And so these guys, they have their certain fields that they're very, very good in. Uh, like Kent Hovind with creationism, like Joe Schimmel uh, with the media and music, like uh, Dave Hunt with Roman Catholicism. They have these outside uh, the scriptures uh, uh, fields of research where they have very good wisdom, very good information, where they're very well researched. Um, but again, that, that's why we started with the Bible. You have to know the Bible so that you can test everything you're hearing by the light of the scriptures. <laughs> This second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance, that ye may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets, and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lusts, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, by which the world that then was, being overflowed with water, perished.
In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light, and God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness, and God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. And God called the firmament heaven. And God said, Let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. And God said, Let the earth bring forth vegetation, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after its kind. And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also, and God set them in the firmament of heaven to give light upon the earth, and to rule over the day and over the night, and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And God said, Let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life, and fowl that may fly above the earth. And God created great sea monsters and every living creature that moves, which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind. And God said, Let the earth bring forth the living creature after its kind, cattle and creeping thing, and beast of the earth after its kind. And it was so. And God made the beast of the earth after its kind, and cattle after their kind, and everything that creeps upon the earth after its kind. And God saw that it was good. And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God he created him. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat of it, for in the day that you eat thereof, you shall surely die. And the temptation's been the same ever since. It's for knowledge. That's what gnosis means, or Gnostic. And that's, um, you know, where, where all occultism springs from. Is, is there some sort of hidden, forbidden knowledge that they have? Esoteric, it's called, um, versus um, exoteric, I think. Um, one is like general, expressed... Um, out there and then esoteric is the hidden that's what a cult means is hidden it's a hidden knowledge 
that you can only attain if you follow certain steps, if you do certain things, um, which eventually at the top of that is, is worshiping Lucifer. Um, so, so all cults lead that way, like uh, the Freemasonry. You know, there's it's it's a Gnostic religion. You're told there's hidden knowledge. There's the great architect of the universe, and he has a name. And there's light, and you can get this light if you attain it. And so you have to learn the secrets as you work your way up. And then uh, was it Manly P. Hall or Pike? One of them, Morals and Dogma, says once they reach that thirty-second degree. They've been sufficiently indoctrinated, brainwashed, to accept that God is Lucifer. They're taught that he is the light bearer. Um, and so, and it's the same in all cults. In, in Mormonism, there's the temple that, that the regular people can't go into. There's hidden rooms that you have to attain to get into there. Uh, there's the Watchtower Society, um, Jehovah Witnesses that hold power and influence. They're the ones with the truth. You know, you have to you have to get it from them. It's attained. Catholicism, um, especially like during the Dark Ages. Don't worry about reading the Bible. The priest will tell you what it means. There's hidden levels of knowledge. And so at the top of those at the top of those pyramid schemes, it's always Lucifer that's revealed. He is the light bearer. He's the one who gives knowledge, and and it's 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 just interesting that that's how it started. Uh, the devil tempted Adam and Eve, come eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. You can be your own god. Um, it's that same temptation. And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a help fit for him. And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air, and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all cattle, and to the fowl of the air, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a help fit for him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs, and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, made he a woman, and brought her unto the man. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Another precursor here, something we're going to get into a lot much later, especially with the Bible version issues. The devil's first words, his first temptation was, Hath God said. It's an attack on the word of God causing people to doubt the word of God. That is the key foundation because if you reject the word of God, then you're left to your own. You get to determine what's right and wrong. You get to decide. You become the authority. Once you reject the authority, the revelation of God, his word, so hath God said to cause doubt. Yeah, did God really say that? How do I know God said that? That's the, that's the temptation. And so what we'll get into a lot in the future with the Bible versions is uh, the confusion on that. Because when you see a footnote that says something like, earliest manuscripts did not contain this, that is saying, hath God said. 
did God really say this? Is this a part of the scriptures I can reject? How do I know this is from God? And if you're not submitted to the absolute authority of the word of God, 100% pure and perfect and from the mouth of God, I can trust every single word. Every word is an authority over me. It is the word of God. The moment I reject that and go, how do I know this is real? How do I know this was in the original manuscripts? How do I know? Well, then I can reject it all. And so like uh, a lot of the creation ministry will focus on Genesis. If you reject the, the, the foundation, if you reject in the beginning God, um, then the rest falls. Because if, if you reject one part, then immediately you could say, well, it's not perfect. It's not preserved. It's not pure. How do I know the rest of it is pure and perfect? If Genesis 1-1 doesn't mean what Genesis 1-1 says, then maybe John 3-16 doesn't mean what it says. If 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 Mark 8, uh, the, the last few verses in Mark chapter 8, um, which the new manuscripts uh, reject, if those aren't real, if those aren't in the Bible, then how do I know Galatians chapter 1 is real? How do I, you're left that, excuse me, it puts you in a position then where you have to trust somebody else an authority figure, a teacher, a, a prophet, uh, a minister to tell you what the scriptures really mean, which part of the scriptures are really authoritative, which like it takes the authority out of the word of God. It's it's hath God said. So any commentaries or footnotes or, or asterisks in the Bible, like those are so dangerous that those are the voice of the devil saying hath God said. You have to know that every single syllable, uh, as Jesus said, uh, every jot and tittle, um, is preserved by God. It's pure and perfect. Every word of it is the authority over our lives. It's per it, it means what it says. And, and we're not allowed to reinterpret it with our own imaginations or the imaginations of others. And we're not allowed to take or to, to add to it. Um, scriptures say that three different times. It is what it is. We have to trust that we hold in our hands the absolute, pure, perfect word of God that is the authority over our lives. Otherwise, we're buying into the devil's lie, half God said. And the woman said, We may eat eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together, and made themselves aprons, and they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam, and said to him, Where art thou? said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked. And God said, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldst not eat? And the man said, The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the woman, what is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. He shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow shalt thou bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. And unto Adam he said, 
Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, till thou return unto the ground. For out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. Russian author and Nobel Prize winner Alexander Solzhenitsyn wrote of the calamities that afflicted his people in the bloody wake of the Russian Revolution. At one point, he said, over half a century ago, while I was still a child, I recall hearing a number of old people offer the following explanation for the great disasters that had befallen Russia. Men have forgotten God, they said. That's why all this has happened. Since then, I have spent well nigh 50 years working on the history of our revolution. But if I were asked today to formulate as concisely as possible the main cause of the ruinous revolution that swallowed up some 60 million of our people, I could not put it more accurately than to repeat, men have forgotten God. That's why all this has happened. In the United States, the phrase, in God we trust, adorns the back of the U.S. dollar bill. Nevertheless, controversy rages to this day about America's Christian heritage and the true intent of the Founding Fathers. But where does this debate begin? The early American colonies at Jamestown and later Plymouth came to America under the authority of King James, who authorized the King James Bible. William Bradford, who came to America on board the Mayflower to become the chief governor of the Plymouth Colony. I want to point something out before he gets into this. I'm sure they're going to point it out too, but uh, people who say America was founded as a Christian nation, um, there's there's some truth to that, and then there's some error. Like you got to remember when the Pilgrims came um, and and Christians fleeing England because of persecution. Uh, they came in like the 1640s, 1650s, I think. Um, so, it, and it, those were probably real Christians, Puritans, and 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 stuff like that, who wanted religious freedom, and and so they came here, like he's saying, under the authority of a king, um, to establish colonies where they could worship God in freedom. They didn't have to worry about uh, the Church of England or Roman Catholicism persecuting them. Uh, they could have freedom to worship as they saw fit, as they read in the scriptures. Um, so that was a Christian foundation. But when the Revolutionary War happened in 1770s, that's 120, 130, 140 years later. Think about how much can change in 130, 150 years. That's like the difference between now and like uh, Civil War time. Um, a lot has changed 
in 150 years. So what started as a Christian uh, foundation might not necessarily have been so during the time of the Revolutionary War. And uh, we'll come to see that, that a lot of the leaders that fomented that revolution uh, were either deists or atheists or agnostics or occultists like Benjamin Franklin. Um, they were, um, they did not have a Christian foundation. Um, they placated Christianity and, and had a lot of their morals based in Judo-Christian ethics, um, but it was a, it was an occult foundation. Um, and you can realize that just by looking at Washington, D.C., look at the monuments. It's not Christian monuments that you see. It's pagan. It's Babylonian, Egyptian, Greek mythology. Those are the statues and symbols that you find. Uh, those are what adorn our dollar bills. It, it's not a Christian foundation. Not to mention the Revolutionary War, whatever you might think about uh, tyranny or freedom or whatever, uh, the Bible specifically forbids us from rebelling against authority. To revolt against the king would have been an unchristian, unbiblical act. Um, God is certainly not going to bless and favor something that disobeys his scriptures. And, and when that was written in, in the book of Romans, Caesar, um, Rome was the authority. Um, a tyrannical uh, dictatorship and we were told Christians were told to submit to the government to live peaceable passive lives um, to be under submission of the authorities um, yes to worship God and if they forbid you to passively worship anyways to say I'm sorry I'm gonna have to keep worshiping knowing that it might cost you your life or your freedom but willing to sacrifice that nowhere were we told to revolt to rebel, to overthrow. Um, so America started with an unchristian act, or the Revolutionary War started with, in an unchristian way. The foundation during the, the pilgrims and stuff, that, that was a, probably a good biblical foundation. But fast forward 150 years to the time of the Revolution, and it's no longer a Christian society, although most of the people in the colonies were probably Christians, or at least called themselves Christians. I would assume there were a lot more born-again saints back then than there are now. I, I would think in America there's been a steady decline. Wrote, may not the children of these fathers rightly say, our fathers were English men which came over this great ocean and were ready to perish in this wilderness. But they cried unto the Lord, and he heard their voice. Let them therefore praise the Lord, because he is good, and his mercies endure forever. John Winthrop, the first governor of the Massachusetts Bay Colony, partly credited with founding the city of Boston, said, We shall find that the God of Israel is among us, for we must consider that we shall be as a city upon a hill, so that if we shall deal falsely with our God in this work which we have undertaken, and so cause him to withdraw his present help from us, we shall be made a story and a byword through the world. The first school built in America was Harvard University in 1636, named after the Reverend John Harvard. Its original motto was, Truth for Christ and the Church. Harvard expected the following of its students. Let every scholar be plainly instructed and earnestly pressed to consider well. The main end of his life and studies is to know God and Jesus Christ, which is eternal life. Therefore, to lay Christ in the bottom as the only foundation of all sound knowledge and learning. At Princeton University, the official motto was, Under God's power she flourishes. Princeton's first president, the Reverend Jonathan Dickinson, said, Cursed be all learning that is contrary to the cross of Christ. While at Yale, the university's stated aim was that all scholars shall live religious, godly, and blameless lives according to the rules of God's word, diligently reading the Holy Scriptures. Dartmouth, Columbia, William and Mary, and Brown University all had similar declarations. In fact, 123 of the first 126 colleges formed in America were formed on Christian principles. America's education system clearly represented the beliefs of some of the earliest founders and leaders. 
James Edward Oglethorpe established the colony of Georgia in 1732, in part as a refuge for persecuted Protestants from Europe. As the first settlers touched the shoreline, they knelt and declared, Our end in leaving our native country is not to gain riches and honor, but singly this, to live wholly for the glory of God. William Penn, the founder of Pennsylvania, wrote, If thou wouldst rule well, thou must rule for God and to do that thou must be ruled by him. Those who will not be governed by God will be ruled by tyrants. Jonathan Trumbull, the British governor of Connecticut, who became sympathetic to the American cause in 1773 said, if you ask an American who is his master, he will tell you he has none, nor any governor but Jesus Christ. George Washington, on May 12, 1779, addressed the Delaware Indian chiefs who had brought their children to be educated in American schools. Washington said to them, You do well to wish to learn our arts and ways of life, and above all, the religion of Jesus Christ. Congress will do everything they can to assist you in this wise intention. Twice appointed Secretary of State Daniel Webster said, if the power of the gospel is not felt throughout the length and breadth of the land, anarchy and misrule, degradation and misery, corruption and darkness will reign without mitigation or end. Noah Webster, whose famous Webster's Dictionary is a legacy to this day, said, No truth is more evident to my mind than that the Christian religion must be the basis of any government intended to secure the rights and privileges of a free people. All the miseries and evils which men suffer from vice, crime, ambition, injustice, oppression, slavery, and war proceed from their despising or neglecting the precepts contained in the Bible. Samuel Adams, in the Rights of the Colonists in 1772, wrote, The rights of the colonists as Christians may be best understood by reading and carefully studying the institution of the great lawgiver and head of the Christian church, which are to be found clearly written in the New Testament. At a 4th of July celebration in 1837, President John Quincy Adams asked, Why is it that next to the birthday of the Savior of the world, your most joyous and most venerated festival returns on this day? Is it not that in the chain of human events, the birthday of the nation is indissolubly linked with the birthday of the Savior? Is it not that the Declaration of Independence laid the cornerstone of human government upon the first precepts of Christianity? The Reverend Jedediah Morse, father of Samuel B. Morse, who developed the Morse Code, said, to the kindly influence of Christianity, we owe that degree of civil freedom and political and social happiness which mankind now enjoys. In proportion, as the genuine effects of Christianity are diminished in any nation, either through unbelief or the corruption of its doctrines, in the same proportion will the people of the nation recede from the blessings of genuine freedom and approximate the miseries of complete despotism. President Andrew Jackson concerning the Bible plainly said, That book, sir, is the rock upon which our republic rests. In 1831, a Frenchman named Alex de Tocqueville came to America to research the American prison system. He came to learn why his own country, France, had so many prisons, while America had so few. In his now famous work, Democracy in America, he would later write, there is no country in the whole world in which the Christian religion retains a greater influence over the souls of men than in America. The Americans combine the notions of Christianity and of liberty so intimately in their minds that it is impossible to make them conceive the one without the other. Upon my arrival in the United States, the religious aspect of the country was the first thing that struck my attention. In France, I had almost always seen the spirit of religion and the spirit of freedom pursuing courses diametrically opposed to each other. But in America, I found that they were intimately united and that they reigned in common over the same country. 
Yet with so many declarations about the Christian faith, history bears witness of what might be called the tares among the wheat. Plymouth Governor William Bradford wrote, Marvelous it may be to see and consider how some kind of wickedness did grow and break forth here, in a land where the same was so much witnessed against. Bradford writes that in 1628, an early colony gave itself over to pagan practices, erecting a maypole, drinking and dancing about it, inviting the Indian women for their consorts, as if they had anew revived the beastly practices of the mad Bacchanalians. And of 1642, Bradford writes of the drunkenness and uncleanness, not only incontinency between persons unmarried, but some married persons also. Even sodomy and buggery, things fearful to name, he says, have broke forth in this land. Yet immoral behavior was not the only concern for the early colonies. In 1637, Massachusetts Governor John Winthrop conducted the trial against Anne Marbury Hutchinson, a woman called at that time the American Jezebel. Hutchinson held meetings in her home and developed a great following. She was accused of having troubled the peace of the Commonwealth and of the churches. Among her controversial teachings was that a man is united to Christ and justified without faith. At her trial, she claimed her teachings were given to her by immediate revelation. Often accused of antinomian or lawless doctrine, she said, As I understand it, laws, commands, rules, and edicts are for those who have not the light which makes plain the pathway. Her former mentor, the Reverend John Cotton, referred to her meetings as a promiscuous and filthy coming together of men and women saying that her opinions would eat out the very bowels of religion. As Hutchinson's trial neared its end, she said defiantly to her judges, if you go on in this course you begin, you will bring a curse upon you and your posterity, and the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. Nevertheless, Hutchinson was found guilty and expelled from the colony. Despite her threat, no record exists of any ill befalling Governor John Winthrop and those who expelled her. Yet Hutchinson's husband, William, would die four years later. And then the following year, in 1643, Anne Hutchinson herself and five of her children were savagely killed by warring Indians, an event regarded by some in Massachusetts as a manifestation of divine judgment. But after her death, Hutchinson retained a following among those who found admiration in her example of defiance. In 1850, two centuries later, Nathaniel Hawthorne refers to her as the sainted Anne Hutchinson in chapter one of his famous work, The Scarlet Letter. Some believe that Hawthorne even based the character of Hester Prynne, the adulterous woman branded with the Scarlet Letter, on Anne Hutchinson herself. While early America recognized Hutchison as the American Jezebel, she is today considered a courageous exponent of civil liberty and religious toleration. Some three and a half centuries later, Harvard University's resident preacher and professor of Christian morals, Peter Gomes, proudly boasts of her that she was, quote, deft in theological and legal sparring intellectually superior to her accusers and a woman of conscience who yielded to no authority. Commenting on Harvard itself, Gomes actually admits the university was originally built to protect future generations from false teachings like those of Anne Hutchinson. Gomes calls her the inadvertent midwife to a college founded in part to protect posterity from her errors. Anne Marbury Hutchison, he says, ironically, would be more at home at Harvard today than any of her critics. This twist in perception seems to symbolize the modern conflict concerning America's original intent of the word freedom. The early settlers believed it their duty to liberate themselves and mankind from the dark age of Europe. Can this be the difference between an America that once was and what she would become? 
A mysterious passage from Hawthorne's conclusion to his classic novel seems to embody the transformation. He writes that the scarlet letter ceased to be a stigma which attracted the world's scorn and bitterness and became a type of something to be looked upon with awe, yet with reverence too. At some brighter period, when the world should have grown ripe for it, in heaven's own time, a new truth would be revealed. I then asked, is this a human being that answers my question so correctly? There was no rap. I asked, is it a spirit? If it is, make two raps. Two sounds were given as soon as the request was made. I then said, if it was an injured spirit, make two raps. I asked, were you injured in this house? I ascertained by the same method that it was a man, aged 31 years, that he had been murdered in this house and his remains were buried in the cellar. What bunch of nonsense. <clears throat> that kind of crap that goes on today where, where people talk to psychics or, or mediums or mystics or whatever, and um, they can be given accurate information or people who think they see ghosts of family members and stuff like that. The Bible speaks of something called familiar spirits. And I, I think that's what that's referring to. The demonic world um, obviously has the power to imitate, um, to replicate, to pretend to be a dead family member or pretend to be somebody that was murdered in a house. But it's, it's demonic. And the whole purpose of that is to discredit the scriptures. Like if, if if people die and their spirit remains here, well, then obviously the Bible ain't right when it says, you know, after death is judgment. So it presents a contradiction. People who believe in the mystics and the psychics and the, the fortune tellers and all that stuff, um, not only are they disobeying the Bible, uh, but the, the entities they're communicating with um, are anti-Christ and and will always uh, attempt to discre discredit scriptures. Hath God said. Um, another thing too, I always find it wise, I think, to um, pray before you start looking into anything like this, where you're going to look into some sort of uh, demonic or mystical or um, spirit type thing to pray for protection. There seems to be um, just the mention of these things can cause... I mean, who knows what's going on in the spirit world, the world around us that we can't see. But talking about these things seems to have an influence, um, at least on your mind or, or f like your fear, your emotions or whatever. So just to, to, before you start researching anything like this, always pray that the Lord would protect you. Um, know your bounds. Don't go too far. We're supposed to be innocent concerning evil. So you don't want to go too deep into it. You want to get the bullet points. You want to know your enemy. You want to know the agenda. But going too deep into it can, can cause issues. So just pray for protection whenever you're going to start looking into stuff like this. This account was given by Mrs. Margaret Fox of Hydesville, New York concerning events that transpired on March 31st of 1848 and describes the beginning of what many consider to be the birth of modern spiritism, the communication with spirits of the dead or beings from the other side of reality. While Mrs. Fox recorded the account, her daughters Kate and Margareta, pictured here with their sister Leah, were considered the real mediums of this encounter. The sisters claimed to have contacted a disembodied spirit they called Mr. Splitfoot. The Fox sisters began a movement that exploded in the 19th century, surrounded with much controversy. The sisters became rich and famous for a time, even traveling with the likes of P.T. Barnum of Barnum and Bailey Circus as professional mediums. While skepticism and accusations of fraud surrounded them in their lifetime, 56 years later, 
On November 22, 1904, the Boston Journal would report that the skeleton of the man supposed to have caused the wrappings, first heard by the Fox sisters in 1848, had been found in the walls of the house occupied by the sisters, and clears them from the only shadow of doubt held concerning their sincerity in the discovery of spirit communication. In the aftermath of the events in Hyattsville, Margareta Fox would experience further encounters. Using the alphabet to communicate, she obtained the following message from a spirit who told her, Dear friends, you must proclaim this truth to the world. This is the dawning of a new era. You must not try to conceal it any longer. When you do your duty, God will protect you, and good spirits will watch over you. At the site of the Fox Cottage at 1510 Hydesville Road, a monument was erected that said, The Birthplace of Modern Spiritualism. Upon this site stood the Hydesville Cottage, the home of the Fox Sisters, through whose mediumship communication with the spirit world was established, March 31, 1848. The monument went on to say, There is no death, there are no dead. Placed here December 5th, 1927. A Masonic obelisk in Rochester, New York further commemorates the event, but investigators continue to question exactly what the sisters encountered. The mysterious name given to their spirit, Mr. Splitfoot, is considered by some to be an old world reference to the adversary of mankind, the devil. In the wake of the Fox sisters' encounter, a man named Phineas Quimby opened an office dedicated to spiritually aided healing in 1859. Quimby is considered the father of the New Thought movement, believed to be the forerunner of what is today called the New Age. Quimby developed a process of healing through altered states of consciousness, achieved primarily through hypnosis. He believed that a person's illness was the result of their spiritual beliefs, Therefore, by getting rid of a person's old belief and introducing them to new thought, he could, supposedly, heal them. His followers write that, in treating his patients, Dr. Quimby allowed his mind for a while to be passive, and in this way he was affected by the troubled mind of his patient, and so could feel his aches and pains. Then because his spiritual senses were freed from his own beliefs, they were acted upon and controlled by a higher intelligence. Through what he learned in his sessions, Dr. Quimby began to abandon his traditional beliefs in favor of what the higher intelligence revealed. This is one point, that's what all that stuff is. When hypnotism, Ouija boards on a low level, um, seances, uh, all those types of things, uh, DMT use, um, peyote usage, those all open you up to demonic possession. Yoga, uh, the free your mind ch chants and mantras um, to, to empty oneself. Um, to do that allows you then to be possessed. And so that, 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 and you get influenced by demonic thought, then you, you open yourself to the spiritual. Pharmakia, pharma, where we get our word pharmaceutical drug use, uh, that word pharmakia means witchcraft. It's, it's, it's using drugs or potions to put yourself in an altered state uh, to communicate with demons as well, whether intentionally or unintentionally, you become influenced. And so the, the higher people go into occultism, the, the more um, efficient they become in using um, seances and stuff like that um, to become more and more demonically possessed. Uh, the high level occultists um, will contact the demonic world frequently and they may even be deceived and they'll, they'll, some of them might call it fourth dimensional aliens like DMT users. Um, or some might call them ascended masters, like the Hinduists or the yoga people or the New Agers. But but it's all Luciferian. It's all the demonic world. Um, you know, the, the Native Americans with peyote use, speaking to the great spirit in the sky. Um, that That's all demonic. It's all Luciferian um, demonic influence on a person. And on a low level, like I say, even using a Ouija board or doing yoga, 
um, can or, or smoking weed can open yourself up to that. The New Thought magazine reported that Dr. Quimby believed Jesus of Nazareth was the one person who taught this science. He said, I have no doubt of his being the only true prophet who had ideas entirely superior to the world. Not that he as a man was any better, but he was the embodiment of a higher wisdom. One of Quimby's patients was Mary Baker Eddy, who would go on to form the Church of Christ Scientist in 1879, based in part upon Quimby's teachings. The young Mary Baker imagined Quimby to possess an understanding of God's law and was ready to proclaim him as the discoverer of the true nature of the healing done in Bible times. It's all these people opening themselves up to, they, they've rejected the idea that the Bible is the source of authoritative knowledge. The Bible is our source of all knowledge for this life and the eternal life. It is where we get truth. Anything outside of that is subjective and, and, and is not binding on us. The truth is in the scriptures. The moment you reject that, you open yourself up to a whole host of other ideas, other, other influences, other thoughts. Um, so then if you experience something, um, because you've experienced it, it becomes reality to you. Like the person hearing the knocking when they're communicating with demons and, and thinking they're talking to a dead guy buried in the wall. Um, like they experienced that and it becomes authoritative rather than remembering the scriptures that say have no communication with familiar spirits or, or don't do necromancy or stay away from witchcraft. You know, so they've rejected that um, either in ignorance or outright uh, denial and they've accepted these other ideas. Um, so then, and, and it's the same whenever you reject the Bible or whenever you open yourself up to, to knowledge, again, the tree of knowledge, or authority coming from some outside source, whether it's a governing body or a teacher or a master or a, or a, um, uh, some sort of ritual uh, or or fourth dimensional spiritual, uh, you know, communication, whatever it is, you're getting information from a source other than the scriptures and accepting it as truth. Um, when it should be rejected as demonic and, and should be fled from and the, the scriptures are our source of truth. So that, that's the distinction. The moment you reject the Bible as your source of truth, you open yourself up to all sorts of craziness. Some people just start relying on their own imagination. I'm sure you've heard people say, uh, my God wouldn't do that when you talk about like hell or um, how homosexuality is a sin. That's not the God I worship. They've created the God in their own imagination. With, failing to realize how insane that is. You have no knowledge outside of self. You don't know what's in the universe. You don't know what created. How can you possibly um, imagine the true God? You're just creating some fabrication. You can't know that. The only way you can know that is to have the outside objective truth, which is the scriptures, the supernatural, God-breathed, God-preserved, um, God-proved. You know, they prove themselves to be the word of God. They prove themselves to be supernatural. That is our source of truth. It's outside of me. It's outside of my fallen imagination. It's outside the influence of teachers and influencers. It's outside the reach of demonic. It is my objective standard of truth, and you have to have that. Though Eddie would break away from Quimby, she continued his practice of healing by correcting the so-called errors of traditional beliefs. She claimed that her teachings were based solely upon the Bible, but that the Bible was full of mistakes, and she was the one to correct them. Of course, she's. It is reported it. that Eddie believed the Bible contained 30,000 errors in the Old Testament and 300,000 in the New Testament. When she published her work, Science and Health, with Key to the Scriptures, she claimed it was the final revelation of God to mankind and asserted that her work was inspired of God. The word key in the title of her book is in reference that she is the key to unlocking the Bible. You ever notice that too? All these people always assume that they're the authority. They're the, they're the person to tell you. You know, nobody ever imagines themselves being a lowly nobody. They always imagine themselves being the this, this supreme interpreter of truth. Which she called a dark book, and that her writings provided the key spoken of in Revelation 3, 7. Therefore, as the key, Eddie sought to explain certain misunderstandings. 
For example, the Bible says, Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church, and let them pray over him. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick. Yet Eddie is criticized for teaching that prayer for the sick is not what will lead to one's healing. Only enlightened understanding heals. Eddie wrote specifically that the common custom of praying for the recovery of the sick finds help in blind belief, whereas help should come from the enlightened understanding. Among other problems were the issues of sin and death. Eddie taught that these things were only illusions and that a person must overcome them by realizing their unreality. Meanwhile, the Bible says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God and that death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. Furthermore, the scripture says that if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But Mary Baker Eddy taught that there is no sin, and the belief in sin, which has grown terrible in strength and influence, is an unconscious error. Concerning the sacrifice of Christ on the cross, she taught that the material blood of Jesus was no more efficacious to cleanse from sin when it was shed upon the accursed tree than when it was flowing in his veins as he went daily about his father's business. Eddie next sought to deny death itself by redefining the resurrection of Christ with shadowy language that seems to foretell the new age. She said, the final demonstration of the truth which Jesus taught and for which he was crucified opened a new era for the world. The lonely precincts of the tomb gave Jesus a refuge from his foes, a place in which to solve the great problem of being. His three days work in the sepulcher set the seal of eternity on time. He proved life to be deathless. Eddie's views concerning Jesus seem to echo the same conclusion wrought as a result of the Fox sisters' spiritual encounter, the idea that there is no death and there are no dead. Researcher Gary Hand sums up Eddie's views concerning Jesus, saying she taught that Jesus Christ was just a man who overcame death by realizing that it did not exist. Therefore, he did not rise from the dead because he never died. Jesus Christ was not the Son of God, did not come from God, but is only an idea from the infinite mind, i.e. the principle of God. The Bible calls that the spirit of Antichrist. Eddie said that Jesus demonstrated the power of Christian science to heal mortal minds and bodies, but this power was lost sight of and must again be spiritually discerned. This desire to generate healing through spiritual means had great momentum in the 19th century. In 1848, supposedly the same day the Fox sisters communicated with the dead, a man named Andrew Jackson Davis wrote in his diary saying, About daylight this morning, a warm breathing passed over my face, and I heard a voice, tender and strong, say, Brother, the good work has begun. Behold, a living demonstration is born. Like Phineas Quimby and later Edgar Cayce in the 20th century, Andrew Jackson Davis performed medical diagnosis and healing while in a mesmerized, trance-like state, making use of what he called the spirit eyes in his forehead. He would be known as the John the Baptist of modern spiritualism and the prophet of the new revelation. In 1844, Davis claimed to be swept away from his home in Poughkeepsie, 40 miles away to the Catskill Mountains, where he encountered the long-dead spirits of the Greek philosopher Galen and the Swedish seer Emanuel Swedenborg. Galen gave Davis a magical staff of healing, while Swedenborg promised to instruct and guide him. Thereafter, Davis considered himself personally guided in his steps by the Swedish mystic. As a result, Andrew Jackson Davis's teachings were nearly identical to those of Swedenborg. Swedenborg, sometimes known as the man who talked with angels, was a spiritual medium who died in 1771, best known for his unbiblical concepts of heaven and hell. In his lifetime, he wrote many books on his experiences, 
though he said that the books were not written by himself. Rather, he claimed they were inspired by spirits and angels from the spirit world. These spirits repeatedly told Swedenborg of the errors of traditional church doctrine. As a result, he would argue against the idea of a triune God, and like Mary Baker Eddy, vehemently rejected the concept of Christian atonement and original sin. Swedenborg's rejection of Christ's atonement on the cross was so extreme that he wrote, This I can affirm, that whenever the angels hear anyone say that God determined the damnation of the human race, and as an enemy was reconciled by his son, they are affected in a manner similar to those who from an uneasiness in their bowels and stomach are excited to vomiting, on which occasion they say, what can be more insane than to affirm such things to God? According to his followers, Swedenborg's teachings declare that there is no such thing as eternal punishment, and that those who find themselves in hell after death can work their way towards something higher. Yet Swedenborg himself warned against the revelations of the very spirits he communed with. In his miscellaneous theological works, he wrote, Spirits narrate things wholly false and lie. When spirits begin to speak to man, care should be taken not to believe them, for most everything they say is made up by them, and they lie. And if man listens and believes, they insist and in various ways deceive and seduce. Despite such contradiction, Swedenborg's influence has been great, impacting churches and with them the ancient orders of Freemasonry. Many Masonic lodges throughout Europe became known as Swedenborgian lodges, and the rite of Swedenborg became part of Masonic ritual. Today, Emanuel Swedenborg is hailed as a hero among spiritists and liberal Christians who have even established Swedenborgian churches, such as the Church of the New Jerusalem, dedicated to his teachings. Perhaps most significant is Swedenborg's example of setting down spirit-communicated writings, something that would set a pattern repeated well into the 20th century and practiced by nearly every major leader of what would become the New Age movement. While Swedenborg channeled many spirits, years after his death, Andrew Jackson Davis would claim to channel him. Supposedly, whilst in a trance, Davis acted as the medium through whom Swedenborg was able to resume his work by dictating various philosophical books, in one of which, published in 1847, he predicted the advent of spiritualism. From 1845 to 1847, Davis delivered some 157 lectures while in a trance-like state in New York City on scientific, historical, and philosophical topics. Reportedly famed macabre author Edgar Allan Poe even attended some of Davis's seances. In what is considered his greatest work, the Principles of Nature, Her Divine Revelations and Voice to Mankind, Andrew Jackson Davis described a mystic view of the cosmos and of creation, promoting the theology of universalism. Some modern spiritists believe Davis's writings shadowed the evolutionary thinking that would soon be set down by Charles Darwin. Darwin's theory of evolution, perhaps the climax of a movement aimed at establishing new thought in the minds of men, would, for many, remove the fear of an almighty creator and widen the gate into the realm of the unknown. Through the 19th and 20th centuries, Western culture has been overwhelmed by a fascination with spirit communication and paranormal phenomena. Some of the most influential people in the modern era have been influenced themselves by New Age spiritism and the occult. From Mary Todd Lincoln, the wife of Abraham Lincoln, who held seances in the White House to communicate with her son Willie, who had died at a young age, to Hillary Rodham Clinton, who supposedly contacted the ghost of Eleanor Roosevelt with New Age psychic Jean Dixon. Hillary is pictured here submitting herself to the power of an American Indian shaman. Inventors, heroes, dictators, 
world leaders, and even American presidents have been either influenced by or directly involved with the movement. Thomas Edison spent years trying to develop a machine that could communicate with spirits of the dead. While his efforts were unsuccessful, Edison was convinced that one day such an invention would be possible. Chester Carlson, the inventor of the now famous Xerox photocopying process, reportedly received the inspiration for his invention from the spirit world. Carl Gustav Jung, whose teachings on the subconscious mind have had a tremendous influence on modern psychology, claimed to be guided by a mysterious spirit named Philemon. Jung's contemporary Sigmund Freud said that it no longer seems possible to brush aside the study of so-called occult facts, the real existence of psychic forces in which, until now, we did not believe. Commenting on his own experiences with powers unknown, Dr. Andrea Puharic wrote, I am personally convinced that superior beings from other spaces and other times have initiated a renewed dialogue with humanity. While I do not doubt their existence, he said, I do not know what their goals are with respect to humankind. Some argue that the goals of these beings were partly witnessed during the Second World War. Adolf Hitler was greatly influenced by spiritual forces, an influence that seemed to shape his horrific Nazi movement. French intellectual Denis de Rogman once described his experience at a Nazi rally in 1938. De Rogman indicated that despite his rigorous attempt to remain detached from the spectacle unfolding before him, he was involuntarily drawn into the vortex of the crowd's hysterical adulation of Adolf Hitler. It was only by dint of a kind of superhuman resolve, said the French philosopher, that he was able to regain his equilibrium before the mesmerizing presence of Hitler's evil genius. Reportedly, de Rogman said of Hitler that some people believe from having experienced in his presence a feeling of horror and an impression of supernatural power, that he is the seat of thrones, dominions, and powers, by which St. Paul meant those hierarchical spirits which can descend into any ordinary mortal and occupy him like a garrison. What I am saying would be the cheapest form of romantic nonsense were it not that what has been established by this man, or rather through him, is a reality that is one of the wonders of the century. Hitler's training as a spiritual mystic came through a secret order known as the Tool Society, an occult organization. Though the cause of such societies may vary, the same occult principles can be found in the Brotherhood of the Masonic Orders, whose members have included some of the most powerful political leaders of the 20th century. To test this argument, Consider Hitler's dream of the Superman alongside this quote from Masonic author W.L. Wilmhurst from his book, The Meaning of Masonry. He writes, This, the evolution of man into Superman, was always the purpose of the ancient mysteries, the religion of Masonry. Man who has sprung from the earth and developed through the lower kingdoms of nature has yet to complete his evolution by becoming a god-like being. Wilmhurst provides a clue, revealing that while the modern spiritist movement is often referred to as a new discovery, its origins date back centuries to the subterranean levels of the ancient world to a time when spirit communication was considered commonplace among men and was at the very heart of the ancient mystery religion. But with this ancient practice also comes ancient warnings found in the writings of the Old Testament. Author Dave Hunt comments on the book of Isaiah. Isaiah 8:20. Why do you turn to 
spirits that peep and mutter, these wizards, the spirits of the dead. I mean, Aunt Jane wasn't too bright when she was alive, but now that she's on the other side, she seems to be a fountainhead of wisdom. Uh, that doesn't make too much sense. Where did she get this from, and how do you know you're even talking to Aunt Jane? Uh, some of them claim, you know, they've all got their spirit guides or whatever, uh, and uh, they don't know who these creatures are that are talking to them and through them. Uh, you go to a, a, a psychic, a medium, and, uh, for example, uh, Bishop James Pike, California Episcopalian Bishop, went to a medium. Well, he was, his son had committed suicide, and he was in his son's apartment in uh, London. And some things would move around. He'd come back from being out, and, and there's some postcards in a certain pattern, and, and, and with messages and so forth. And he began to think that his son, Jim Jr., was trying to communicate with him. So he went to Anatolia, a famous psychic there in London. And what do you know? She goes into a trance. And, uh, you know, the prophets in the Bible don't go into a trance. They don't get into an altered state and then something takes over. God speaks to them. Uh, never do they do that. But anyway, she goes into a trance and, wow, it sounds like his son's voice, Jim Jr., speaking through her. And he says things that only he and his son would know. She couldn't possibly know. Uh, this has happened multiple times. Uh, so that convinces him it must really be his son. Yeah, but what does his son say? You see, we, we go by what, in part, in many ways of analyzing them, but in part we go by what do they say? Well, first thing his son Jim says, Dan, I'm not here for a pleasant afternoon's conversation. I have a mission now. Uh, I want you to know that God isn't personal. He's a force. And Jesus is not the Savior. I mean, he's just a more highly evolved uh, being that I am, I've heard about him, I haven't seen him yet, but he's on a higher plane. Uh, and on and on it goes. Uh, spirit survival. No, Dad, there's no judgment. Uh, God doesn't judge you, you don't face him in judgment. We just move into graduate school and we continue to learn our lessons, you know, and progress and so forth. All of the lies undermining what the Bible says, but the Bible is the book that has true prophecies. No false prophecies. You can't escape it. It's true, okay? So when these entities begin to uh, disagree with the Bible and undermine the Bible, I know who they are. In fact, uh, you know, I've interviewed people around the world. I've been studying this thing for years. Uh, whether they're channelers, you've got about a thousand of them in Los Angeles. We used to have, I don't know how many they have now. Or read some of your New Age publications. They will admit that what the channelers, what the psychics, what the mediums say all over the world who've never been in touch with one another, there's a continuity to it. There's an amazing uh, uh, similarity, not just a similarity, but it's it really, it's coming from the same source, obviously. And there's a definite philosophy that is presented that conforms to the four lies that the serpent introduced to Eve in the Garden of Eden. <laughs> that God is not personal, but a force, that you don't die. There's no death, you just get recycled. Reincarnation. And we're moving upward, we're evolving upward to Godhood. You can become a God, that's the lie of the serpent. And the fourth one, nothing wrong with you, it's the way you think, you need to be initiated into this knowledge, the tree of knowledge, with a dark and a light side, you know, the Star Wars Force and so forth. They all say that. It's consistent. Well, that tells me who's behind it. It was the same thing that Satan said through the serpent to Eve in the garden. So I don't regard these people uh, with any respect. Unfortunately, and some of them may be sincere, uh, they have sold out to Satan because they rejected the true God, they rejected the Word of God. I mean, what I consider what the Bible tells me and the prophecies it gives me, and the proof, for example, that Jesus is the Messiah, all that it says, centuries, thousands of years, in fact, some of them, before he came, where he would be born, even the day he would ride into Jerusalem and so forth. I mean, you cannot escape it. This is the truth. Now, anybody who then turns from this book, and we've got 
some sincere people that I think may be real Christians in, in, the, in the charismatic world, and I'm not against uh, uh, someone believing in the power of the Holy Spirit. But the Bible is not enough for them. You know, they, if God would only give them orders every morning in neon sign across the sky, or if they could hear a voice, you know, and I, some of these people I talk to, and they, oh, Dave, let me tell you what the Lord just told me about you. Really? Well, the Lord hasn't told me. And I'll check you out against the Bible, you know, and I'm not interested. But you say, why do people get involved in this? They want to know the future. They want to know what's going to happen to them. I mean, if you knew what was going to happen to you. Somebody says, hey, the Lord told me, your immediate response would be, what chapter and verse? Oh, that ain't scripture? Well, then the Lord didn't tell you. Uh, the canon is closed. The Lord has, in these last days, spoken through his son and his son's apostles. That is our closed canon. Uh, it's not to be added to or taken away. Uh, that's not to say the Lord doesn't... Uh, guide you in your day-to-day -day life and your your the Holy Spirit is within you um, giving you an unction a prompting um, an understanding to recall the precepts and principles outlined in the scriptures to direct your life but he's not prophesying anything to the world anymore there's no new word from the Lord coming out uh, the canon is closed the scriptures are sufficient so that's what we need um, so anybody who says, thus saith the Lord, or the Lord told me, uh, your immediate response should be chapter and verse. Yeah, what would you do? Uh, you, you, you're going to have a wreck? Are you going to try to avoid that street? Or I mean, it, it just doesn't work. It doesn't make sense. But they want somehow to get some power, some control over their lives. And they're very curious what's going to happen. Well, they're going to the wrong source. To find out what's going to happen and it has brought disaster i've written books about it brought disaster into many lives spirit channelers and mediums from all walks of life claim contact with the spirit realm the purpose of this contact supposedly is to teach mankind to achieve a higher state of consciousness through the knowledge they present. A classic example is Jay-Z Knight, a highly successful spirit channeler who channels a spirit calling itself Ramtha. Ramtha's School of Enlightenment claims to reach some 60 cities in 26 countries around the world. In this interview, shot in 1998, Knight explains how she came in contact with her guiding spirit. And this was like an angel in my kitchen. You, do, you don't have time to react. You don't have time to, to, to rationalize this in your life. This is happening in your little kitchen. You just, I just blurted out, you're so beautiful, who are you? And he smiled. This beautiful smile lit up the whole room, and he said, I am Ramtha the Enlightened One, she and I've come insane. to help you over the ditch. And I looked back up at him, and he said, Beloved daughter, he said, I have come to make you a light to the world. Equipped with a bad British accent, something that seems common among channelers, Knight gives herself over to the spirit of Ramtha. I am Romtha the Enlightened One. I am 35,362, one and 37 seconds years old. I was born in that which is termed a great a marvelous lunatic. place called Muria, and my destiny here is to teach you that which you desire to know, and to <laughs> let you know that every word that I say... Oh, man. <laughs> It's comical, but it's it's so dangerous that foolish people buy into this stuff, you know. Um, first of all, if an angel appears to you, uh, call on the name of Jesus. You know, in the scriptures, when an angel appeared, people fell at their feet in fear and trembling like dead men. Uh, but the scriptures tell us to test every spirit, whether it be from God or not. And to test it, you can ask them, who do you say that Jesus is? If they if they don't if if they don't confess Jesus Christ God in flesh, um, it's demonic, you know, and 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 you pray for the Lord to protect you and to cast that thing out. Um, 
you know, it's it's it, it, just sheer lunacy. But it's because people have rejected the Bible or don't have biblical understanding uh, that they can be influenced by these demonic forces. I will manifest for you in your life. Incredibly, throughout the interview, Rantha and Knight repeat the central themes of the New Age movement over and over, insisting that there is no death and that man himself is a god, his only task being to realize his self-empowerment. So I must become the teacher. I must plant in your mind outrageous concepts. Here, Knight denies that Ramtha is a demon, but believes he was a man who has achieved divine status due to knowledge and experience. He's not a devil. He's not a demon. He's not a guru. He's a god. I am a teacher and a god. I'm a god because I experienced all of these things. And I am a teacher, the devil in that not of truth, eyes. but of philosophy. Ramtha insists that his teaching is simple, to get people to realize the great intelligence within themselves, and that they can do no wrong. It's really simple. First you have to acknowledge that you are the great intelligence that lives in you. And your body is an extension of that intelligence. And there is no good and bad in God. That's impossible. As if echoing the voice of the serpent, Knight now directs the listener to the path to of the sacred God. knowledge. We deserve to know the truth. And those who ask are going to be given everything, going to be given all the sacred knowledge. We are not given but one lifetime to prove what we know. This is not a test. It is an opportunity. Ramtha propagates the New Age lie that man has many opportunities to get it right through reincarnation and evolution. Years ago, I would say that I'm relatively young to many of you who have been reincarnating and slowly evolving to ask the great questions, the great mysteries, to have them revealed here. My daughter is here simply to say, you're an immortal. You are wearing this body as if you wore a garment of silk or a garment of roughly hewn wool. Mark. You are here simply to wear the garment and to live the experience, but you have never died and never will. That is not in the plan of God. Same line Next, Knight and Ramtha deny that God is a person, but insist he is a natural life force that exists in everyone. He saw what God really is. God is not a being. It is life itself. It's, it's the will of life. And it's in everything. You want to help people? And you have to live your light. And you have to be proud that you accept if God lives, He is in me. And you are a righteous man for saying so. Because if He lives in you, then He lives in everyone. Why cannot everyone share such a treasure. I love his message, Behold God. I love it that he says to us that we are divine. The journey of awakening is not through a Redeemer, but when we realize we are our own Redeemer. It is a lie, it is a lie, what the fanatics tell you. As with the rest of the movement, rejecting the gospel of Jesus Christ and the teaching of the church is essential to the message. As long as we think that some channel, some channeled entity, some Christ, some priest, some preacher, some deity, some prophet is our redeemer that excuses us from living life, we have missed the message. Why don't we learn to think on our own? and find new benefactors for that greatness. Genius, you know, is that which is not mediocrity, is not predictable, is not funded, it's hard to watch it's not hired. It is that which can dream beyond the paradigms. You have the ability to be a genius 
And did you know that every dream that you dream should never be put aside as imagination? That every dream is the next step of your evolution. The devil talks through a lot of different ways. Sometimes it's dangerous because it's so deceptive and alluring. Sometimes it's just insane and laughable that it's like, you know, what a bunch of ridiculous nonsense. And Ramtha gives us permission. He first says, you are God. Now let's get about learning how to be that. Religion is no longer sacred. Everyone questions the church. They should. Everyone questions the meaning of life. And everyone questions the direction that science has taken. And when you do that, it is an age of enlightenment. We cannot have. Enlightenment does not come on the heels of the Black Plague. No, that is not enlightenment. Enlightenment comes on the heels of plenty. Because only when you are gluttonous to everything and you question everything are you right to know what you have never known. So forget about the past and live today on the wisdom, the virtue of what you've gained. You don't have to feel guilty about your life anymore. I would love someone to stand up and say, God doesn't live outside of you. God is you. Well, uh, well Jay-Z Knight is among the more successful mediums. She is certainly not alone. Stop. A nearly identical doctrine is preached from a series of channelers who believe they are in communication with extraterrestrial spirits from other planets and galaxies. In the documentary UFOs and Channeling, the late actor Telly Savalas reveals that the purpose of channeling these alien entities is entirely consistent with the purpose of the New Thought New Age movement, to change the thinking of mankind. Okay, we'll stop there. So that was tough to watch. I mean, just sheer lunacy. It's um, insane. But on the next part, it looks like we're going to look at these channelers who think they're talking to aliens. Um, like I say, they, it's either aliens or fourth dimensional beings or ascended masters or evolved spirits. You know, But they all have that same message to deny the scriptures. It's that same thing that the devil through the serpent spoke to Adam and Eve in the garden. Uh, ye shall be as gods, ye shall not surely die, hath God said, um, you know, an attempt allure to knowledge. Um, so it's that same temptation over and over again. Um, and, and we'll see in the next part how, how people think they're talking to aliens. And then I think it's going to culminate by showing like how this influences uh, American politics and, and, and worldwide politics. I, th I think it goes in that direction. If not, we certainly will go in that direction in, in uh, as we move along down this path. But um, anyways, that's what I got for you guys tonight. Um, as always, I appreciate you watching. Um, I love you and Lord willing, we'll talk to you next time.